perfect. Uh, here we go. I'm sorry for uh, the short delay, but the lunch is an uh, important part of the day and, and can't be postponed. Uh, uh, I think we have good inspiration after the talk of Jenny Tennyson when it comes to, to trust and sustainable data institution. And now we focus on, on, on the concrete tools. And uh, data altruism is part of the legislative framework for the governance of common European data spaces. The planned legislative framework would tackle the problems with cross-sector relevance in four thematic clusters. And one thematic cluster addressed the support of use of data that individuals or companies voluntarily contribute to the wider public good. It is my pleasure that I have uh, really distinguished speakers uh, today with me. Um, unfortunately, Barbara and, and Joanna couldn't make it because of the corona restrictions. Uh, but I'm happy to see them on the, on the screen. And um, I would say uh, let's start with uh, and among Barbara uh, uh, and, and, and Joanna we have uh, That's Dirk, strange. Dirk uh. Rockman from the Robert Koch Institute and Humboldt University and Sebastian um, uh, von Kilmanzek from the University of, of Kiel and it's really my pleasure that you are today with me. So let's start maybe first with, with uh, Barbara who would maybe say a couple of words of the general concept. How do you understand data donation? Can you see uh, me or no? uh, what do you, uh, how would you describe the whole concept? And then in the second step, we continue with, with uh, uh, Joanna, who will uh, try a bit more in detail to describe the concept of thin data. Oh, yeah, I wasn't allowed. I mean, I wasn't allowed to travel without a Corona test. Me neither, so. So please. Uh, so I Barbara? can't hear Pencho. Oh. Huh. Neither do I. Uh, Not... Let's start with. Uh, and among Barbara uh, uh, and, and, and Joanna, we have. Uh, uh, from the Humboldt University and Sebastian um, uh, from Kilman. So, Barbara, can you start, please? We have technical problems. Till we fix the problem, I, as I originally said, the whole concept. And then in the second step, we continue with with uh, uh, Joanna, who will uh, try a bit more in detail to describe the concept of thin data. Oh yeah, I wasn't allowed. In. So uh, I wasn't allowed to travel without the test. Me neither. So so please. Uh, so I Barbara. can't hear Pencho. This is this is kind of problem. Let's uh, please uh, uh, switch them. Please switch them off. In the meantime, we are going to try to fix the problem, and we continue with Dirk, who would describe the concept of uh, Datenspende that we have in Germany with uh, alternative app uh, next to the Corona One uh, app. Uh, could you tell us a bit more, Dirk? Uh, what's the story behind the Corona uh, Datenspende app, data donation app? Can you please use the micro? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Yes, okay. So, in a nutshell, the Corona Data Donation Project is, uh, is a way uh, in which people can help us uh, scientists better understand the time course of the COVID pandemic. And uh, in a nutshell, it works like this. People can donate the data that is being collected by their wearable devices, which is the resting heart rate and the steps they take every day. And it turns out that uh, if you look at, you know, this data, you can detect when people have uh, develop a fever. When they have a higher body temperature, they tend to have a higher heart rate and they take fewer steps if they're in bed statistically. And when you aggregate this data over, we have now half a million donors, um, you can see much earlier than the uh, reporting system of cases whether there's a local outbreak or uh, you know a hotspot in, in Corona, and you can kind of monitor the the case count with uh, with you know five to six days prior to what happens in the in the reporting system. So that's the general idea. But the general idea is wider. Um, it's not just so. If I go back ten years uh, in my community, everyone was just looking at data that you could scrape off the internet or you could talk to. 
phone uh, companies and get mobility data, etc. So that was the state of the art. But then um, there was uh, an event that happened to me when I visited a friend of mine who was a professor in Denmark who said, you know, this is not the way it's supposed to work. You know, we have to uh, design participatory experiments where, you know, the people that provide the data are within the group that actually also look at the data so that it's a participation. So he designed a, uh, a transparent lab where all the code was, uh, was, was open, where people could walk in and see uh, what is being done with their data. So he essentially bought a thousand cell phones and distributed it to students and collected everything about them, where they were, their activities on social media, etc., uh, in a way uh, that was entirely open. And so these students, they were able to walk in and look at their data. And uh, what was also very special about this is that every day they had to agree that on that day the data was collected. So it was like a, a day-based opt-in kind of scenario. And, and he put a lot of brain uh, effort into designing a concept of a participatory experiment um, and this whole data donation idea. And we figured uh, if we can do something like this in public health in Germany in this crisis, uh, it's that. And so that's what we, how we set this up. And there is, uh, it's designed in a way so as much as we can, we take the donors along, we inform them in a continual basis on a blog on the information that we, that we get, the scientific information, the insights, and also the entire process, like the problems we run into, we report on them, the difficulties on the scientific end. So it's really uh, very characteristic for this project. And um, so far it's been running very well because uh, you know, f from April on we had half a million users and, uh, and that all of these users, they provide data or have been providing data for months now. One more concrete question. Why are these data so uh, relevant for the science? We are in the midst of the pandemic. And yes. We basically need for scientific purposes many, many data focal points. That's true. So one of the things that, that we have to deal with is getting um, a right assessment of the situation in terms of like the case counts and also the dynamics of the pandemic. And we have to do it as quickly as we can. So, for instance, now, during the past weeks, we've seen in Germany an, an increase in case counts. And there's a trend in this. And it's quite a good idea. Or another event was a, a large local outbreak in one of the meat factories. And so it's a good thing if we have an early warning system that detects these prior to the, you know, delayed uh, reporting system so we can see it that is the promise of this whole project and uh, it's just a monitoring system a surveillance system for the COVID-19 uh, situation in Germany in different regions on a national level and then spatially or geographically resolved that's the idea and it's all about sort of fever detections but it's a lot wider, of course. Of course. Many thanks. Maybe let's let's uh, try the second at attempt with, with uh, Barbara describing the general concept and understanding of, of, of data donation. I hope Barbara is now listening to us from Vienna and uh, can start her first input. <laughs> Yes, I have been listening to you earlier, <laughs> Pancho, but I think there was a problem with the link. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Continue. Wonderful. And can you see this, the screen as well? Yes. The slide. Wonderful. Excellent. So what I'm going to do in the time um, assigned to me, and I would like to also thank you very much again for, for having me here, is, um, as, as Pencho already mentioned, talk about the notion of data donation. And I will argue that it's the wrong term for the right problem. So I will start with what the problem is, what whether we can donate data, and, and what data donation uh, means in, in the era of what I call the Isle Leviathan. So the problem has been discussed today and also yesterday and is sufficiently well known. So I will just uh, very, very briefly go through this. So the, there are lots of visions out there. And here this is just an example um, from the domain of medicine. This is an iconic slide from the National Academy of Sciences 
um, um, report on precision medicine um, in 2011, where the idea is that you integrate all those different data sets and you create um, individual maps, layover maps for each individual patient. And obviously, and we heard about a lot about this yesterday and also today, one of the issues here is that interoperability for one, but also the fact that many of those data are not available because there are um, restrictions and red tape around it and, and other obstacles. So that's one, one problem. Um, the other problem, and I think I will focus on that, um, to complement what has been discussed previously, is the, the issue of trust. So this is a, a, a paper that we just published two weeks ago in the American Journal of Human Genetics, and it's the world's largest survey of, of people and how they, tr they trust with their own personal information, not only medical and genomic information and data, but also, also that. And it's quite a sobering, actually, if you look at, um, only at these figures here on the slide, only 50% roughly would donate for medical research um, and uh, would share their data for medical research. And um, the, the, the proportion of people who are willing to share with for-profit companies is much, much lower. And obviously this is also problematic in the sense that the two are very often intertwined, but let's not go into that. Let's just say that there is a problem. And the problem I think has a lot to do with what um, what we call um, the I Leviathan problem. What do we mean by that? We mean the fact that there's, uh, you know, Jerry Kang called it big brother and company man. It's no longer big government, but it's now also big corporations um, that are create that, that people like with the, the, the original Hobbes Leviathan, people give up sovereignty and control to the Leviathan in order to get something back. What is what? What is it that they get back? It's it's no longer um, civic freedom, but it's something else. It's services, it's entertainment, it's connectedness, and so on. So this happens against the backdrop of increasing power asymmetries between data subject and data users, and as Harry Surden called it, the end of strict structural privacy, uh, merely by the fact that many more aspects of our lives and bodies are being datafied. So a lot of the discussion and also here at this event has focused on strengthening individual control. And as important as that is, there are a lot of problems with focusing only on individual control. Um, I'm not going to go through the list in detail. Um, many of those problems are well known, but I think there's some value in seeing them as a whole. Um, not only alert fatigue, but more important are the political aspect, such as the, it can conceal power asymmetries, it individualizes responsibility, it, in, it isolates the relationship between the data subject and the data user, which I think accounts to some extent why there's so so, so little trust, why there, there is, um, besides the enforcement and implementation problems, um, there is the feeling that um, people are have to resign, they have no longer control. So also for this reason, there are more and more people who think that we need to strengthen, in addition to individual control, collective oversight and responsibility. And now I'm getting to the key point, where does the data donation sit here? So um, amongst the, the, the notions of strengthening, amongst the examples of strengthening um, collective responsibility and oversight, and we have heard examples yesterday and also today, um, the notion of data donation was um, promoted among or used among other institutions by the German Ethics Council and also by a very good um, an expert opinion. Um, it's not available in English, so excuse, forgive me for, for using the uh, German slide here, but I translated the definition of data donation here. Um, it's Daniel Strech et al. And they define it as the voluntary and informed consent of third parties processing certain personal medical data in compliance with legal provisions and so on. So I think that it's a problem. The notion of data donation is, is a misnomer. Why? If we look at what donations normally are, they are something that is, um, is not commercial. So that's fine, right? That's not a problem. They are something that um, are embedded in a notion of indirect reciprocity. And here I mentioned something that is hardly discussed in this debate. Donations are not taking place in a social vacuum. As Marcel Moss and others have pointed out, 
there's always donations, even if they are unidirectional, they're always embedded in thick relations between people, expectations, moral obligations, and so on and so on. So this is one aspect that, that I will highlight um, the relationality of data and also of governance models. Also, of course, donations are consumable and rivalrous. What does this mean? If I donate a kidney, I no longer have it. This is one of the reasons why the notion of data donation is so problematic. It suggests that I make my data available and I no longer have control. Not only not as an individual, but also not as part of a collective. And this is, this is, that alone shows why data donation is a misnomer. The, the next problem is also that the, the notion of a donation um, is actually in many ways derived from um, the medical model where I'm, you know, where there's a, a physical body, a physical body with a boundary, um, with, a, with a unique location in space, and all those things we don't have with data. Data are distributed, they are simultaneous, and the one thing that data have, the data body has in common with the physical body is that both are relational. I'm getting to my to the end. Um, so if we think of thinking of data donation as a means to address the power asymmetry um, between data users and data subject in the era of, of the Isle of Iathan, then a lot of uh, discussion in the academic uh, circles, and here I'm mentioning Kurtzner and Floridi has focused on post-mortem data donation, which is a totally different um, case, and I think that, that there's some merit in considering that. Um, but data donation, quote unquote, by living people leaves open the question. Exactly. Sir. Um, Barbara, maybe maybe you switch off the the video and just leave the. But we need still the presentation; it won't work. Um, okay, now we have again technical problems, but I think we. Um, receive the main messages that, that Barbara said when it comes to the notion of, of uh, data donation. She already made an advertisement of your paper, Sebastian, uh, where you took part. Uh, the, this is the expert opinion uh, uh, where you, you participated on behalf of the Federal Ministry of, of, of Health. Um, one basic issue also in, in context of, of Corona Datenspende app is, is the consent. Um, what's what's uh, how how do you see this issue? Where is the problem when it comes to the consent in the context of, of, of data donation? Is it, is it on? Yeah. Right. Okay. Perhaps I, I, I simply add to <clears throat> to what Baba said. In, indeed, the term data donation is somewhat problematic. <clears throat> I don't like it too much um, either, though for different reasons. Um, I, as a lawyer, my main problem is that implies that it gives a legal solution, but data donation obviously is not a concept of data protection law, and so it, it doesn't really help. What it does, it gives the process of giving data for the sake of medical research or whatever, it gives it a, a, a more friendly face. And I think that was the main intention of creating this term. Um, now, the way we did apply it was um, in, in, in this expertise for, for the federal ministry, which, which you have mentioned, was a very specific case. It was not data donation or any, anything like that in, in, as a general concept, but in the, co <clears throat> in the concept of med medical research. So that is a very specific context. And our starting point was that indeed, as you said, the normal way of getting data for medical research is informed consent. Um, and that seems fair enough. Isn't that the ideal starting point? Um, of course it is. You do ask the people and, and, and they can say yes or no. Why shouldn't that the way? Um, there are reasons indeed why, why it is problematic. That is not because um, autonomy wouldn't be a good starting point. I think it is because autonomy is also good for trust in research and we do need trust in research, trust from, from, from the public. So autonomy is fine, but informed consent in the way we do it in, in data protection law is not the only way um, to have autonomy in the system. And um, the problem of informed consent is at least a threefold. Um, first of all, it, you, you have a selection in the end, a selection of those patients which you get because some will give their consent. 
and others will not give their consent and then there is a group which you don't even manage to ask and they drop out as well. So you have a selection and selection of patients. Patients easily leads to a bias in the scientific results which you try to get out of these set of data. So for, for reason of scientific validity, um, informed consent also already has a certain uh, flaw. The second point is from the point of view of um, the patient himself because informed consent on such a complex matter as medical research and the way it works is a very ambitious thing. Just try to explain that in a few words what is actually happening. You probably won't manage. The templates which are recommended are around six, eight, seven pages long. Um, and that is very difficult for, page, for patients actually to grasp and to understand, in particular in this very situation. So it seems a bit unfair to, to force a, a decision um, out of them. And the third argument um, is the administrative burden, obviously, to, 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 to have informed consent procedures. That's fine if you have a few candidates for clinical research, but if you try to do that on a large scale, say every patient which comes to a German hospital or university hospital should take part, and you have to explain that to everyone, in particular uh, in an oral explanation, which works much better than written explanation. A colleague of mine has um, calculated that even in, in, in his hospital alone, which is Kiel University Hospital, you would need 30 full staff personnel if you want to have a decent oral explanation to every patient purely on data protection. And of course, that is a problem because resources are scarce. There is one important part, I, I believe, in the, in, in the expert opinion. You say that the process of data donation should be decoupled in time and space from, in, in, from the context of medical treatment and instead be unhorged in, in normal everyday life. Why is that important? It is perhaps even more important than your first question, opt in or opt out. I think it, is, it, is, it should be the starting point of thinking that indeed the common system is to ask patients and that means to ask people in a situation when they come to a hospital and they do not come to hospital to donate their data but they come to hospital because they need treatment. And that is the, t the, 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 the moment where you can get hold of them and so that's you, you, you get there and try to, to persuade him to donate his data. Um, that's of course a problem because in this very situation the patient has very different problems. He is there because he needs treatment, he has medical problems, he has to cope with lots of formula which he has to fill in and to read about his treatment and health insurance and money and etc. And then you come on top with that with six, seven, eight uh, or even more pages on data donation. That, that is a very bad moment and it is probably an illusion to think that anyone would be able for, for a, a rational decision of uh, such a scale in that very moment. Um, so for that reason we argue that it would be much better um, to, um, to, to get earlier to the patient or the, the not yet, the would-be patient in that situation, uh, to the population in general, so that everyone has the possibility to think about that um, at home in, in a much more convenient situation and not very much when he is in the treatment situation. Clear message. Many thanks. Uh, shall we maybe try um, now to hear a bit more about the concrete example with Finn data? Um, are you listening to us? Barbara, Joanna? Um, we have lost the connection. We have a kind of Verbindung. Um, können Sie bitte nochmal versuchen, die zu erreichen? Okay. Schicken Sie bitte nochmal den Link vielleicht an den beiden. Vielen Dank. Um, so we continue the discussion in English as in the beginning. Um, we have um, a concrete example in Germany. Uh, how many uh, um, followers, so to say, you have on, 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 on that project and who is in the real control of this data? So we have around 500 thousand people that have been donating data since April and when we communicate with them the only way at the moment is you know because that's an essential part that I also alluded to in the beginning that if you do a project and I think it's it's a part that should not be underestimated if one does a project like this that we 
keep the people that donate their data, I'm going to use the term because I'm, you know, I, I have no alternative at the moment, uh, and it describes it, you know, as best as we can, we have to keep them informed about the process. Um, like this whole idea of informed consent, uh, the part that informed means is that we keep in this project, keep everyone on track and explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what the problems are, etc. to have them uh, come along in this scientific process. And so that is uh, an important part, and I think it's part of the success uh, of the whole project because we haven't been losing anyone uh, in the process. And, and there is a, you know, a shift in the community in this whole field of computational social science, which is the field that looks at data of this nature um, outside of the traditional you know, medical research when, you know, when people look at uh, individual data that's in mobility data or um, you know, behavior that is expressed on social media, etc. There is a shift in the way people are doing this now and everyone is envisioning, or at least I do, al along with a couple of other people that are doing this, to have something like a data institute, uh, a broker that is sort of the interface between the scientists on one hand and the donors. Do you, do you consider yourself as a data broker in this, in this context? No, no. I would like to see uh, this implemented. And, you know, I envision a, a platform where people that are willing to donate data to help others, to select projects which they think when they read reports on it or descriptions of it, they can say, okay, I would like to my data to help these people or to uh, give my data to this scientific project. And the scientists have to explain what they're doing. And, and so there's an instance, an interface that distributes this. Um, that would be excellent. We don't have this at the moment, so we have to you know, do it ourselves essentially. Uh, with all the overhead that comes along with it. But I think it's a step into the future where people uh, you know, can see where they can give their data to um, and, uh, and be informed about it. What are the benefits so far? Do we have more insights um, after a couple of months, uh, data donation? Oh, they're massive. Um, they're massive. So the, uh, initially we had two goals, and that was to be able to have an early warning system that could detect local outbreaks. Uh, and the other one was to have a monitoring system that could, um, you know, tell us the time course of the case count in Germany earlier than the monitoring system could, the, the traditional sort of reporting system. And that works. Um, that works very well. In addition to that, and that's also part of something that has to be discussed in this kind of scenario, is that when we look at this data, we have to do all sorts of preliminary analyses. For instance, what is the heart rate distribution in Germany? And we see the heart rate on average is larger in the, in the east than in the west. And so we look at this and we need it for our analysis, but we get an immediate insight that was not part of our anticipated research. Uh, but we see it and it opens up new questions. And we see it in the data and that is good in a scientific sense because it will you know, open up new questions you know, about you know, the health differences in the, in the East and the West, etc. All sorts of auxiliary or collateral insights we get. But one has to be prepared to deal with this sort of thing because many of these things you don't see coming. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's something that has to be solved in these kind of projects where you collect lots of data. In our case, it's a very simple data in a sense. It's just heart rate and step counts every day for six months or so. But you can see a lot of structure in if, you, if you look at these time series. Um, and so one has to be prepared to uh, that there is additional information that you that you see immediately just doing a pre-analysis of the data. And in your team, you have also a data um, protection spe specialist, uh, uh, and you are oh, addressing yeah. all the all the issues continuously. Yeah, that's that's a very sophisticated project. You know, this is a project that was released by the Robert Koch Institute, and of course, there's uh, uh, someone at the institute who does the data protection, and he was involved from the very beginning. That's another important thing here. 
uh, often, uh, you know, in, a, in the scientific community, I, that's my experience, because I'm also half at the university, someone does a project and then there has to be something written about data protection, etc. Someone looks at it and then, but no one takes it really seriously. And, or no, I shouldn't say that, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not on the top priority. And what's very important when you design projects like this is that the people that have the knowledge about data protection, that they are in the process from the very beginning. I was very naive about this. I didn't know the difference between anonymization or pseudonymization. You know, I didn't, I had no idea. And that person explained it to me. And it wasn't so hard, but you know, I had, it had to be explained to me. And so that's why it's important that these specialists are in this from the very beginning, like even when the system is designed. We come back to this issue again. I hope now that the technique uh, uh, will be on our side and I really hope that uh, Johanna will be able to say a couple of words about FinData. It's a really new project, uh, I think almost um, less, less than a year in, in, in Finland. Uh, and they um, are under the responsibility of the Finnish uh, Ministry of, of Health. Please, shall we try? FinData. <laughs> Yes, uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Um, is the technique on our side? Can you? Yes, light? yes, yes. Please continue. Okay. Um, so um, I'll start from the beginning. Um, if I put them on full screen, perhaps you can see, see it better now. Um, Okay, so um, uh, I'm from FinData, which is the Social and Health Data Permit Authority. So actually, we are not an, an, an project, but we are an, a real authority um, uh, based on, on, on the new law on, on the secondary uh, use of, of social and health data. So I have a couple of slides about the legal basis. Uh, we have an, an act on secondary use of health and social data in Finland. And then I, I have a couple of slides about uh, FinData's role. And then, then I, I have some points uh, from the Finnish uh, point of view um, uh, to bring in, in into this discussion. Um, so if that's okay, I, I'll, I'll go, go on. Um, uh, the Act on Secondary Use of Health and Social Data uh, came into effect uh, in May last year, 2019, and it regulates, the, as, it, as the name says, it regulates the, the secondary use and, and the purpose is to streamline and secure the, the secondary use of social and health data for uh, also other purposes than research. Uh, in Finland, the cornerstones for, for secondary use are uh, we have very rich national data uh, registers. Um, um, the time series go back to 1950s. Uh, for example, in the Finnish Cancer Registry, we have all cancers diagnosed in the Finnish people since 1952. So, so they are really, really a um, good, good described as a gold mine, and many other registers too. Uh, in Finland, we have the, as in many European countries, we have the unique personal identity code, uh, which um, uh, provides the possibility to, to link the personal information from uh, various registers. Um, as Barbara and, and the others uh, mentioned, the trust is very important um, uh, and is, is really a cornerstone for everything. So without uh, the citizens not trusting the authorities to keep the data safe and to use it for the common good and good purposes and, and also the citizens being able to benefit from the results like as um, better health care and better medicines. Um, this won't, wouldn't be, be working without that. Um, 
the last cornerstone is the cooperation between FinData and the data controllers. So we are not, FinData uh, uh, um, has no data on itself, but we collect the data from the different registers and the healthcare providers, and then, then um, uh, transfer it for, for the clients to use. Um, another slide about the legal basis. Uh, the new act gives FinData uh, the authority to grant uh, for secondary use basically all the uh, all, all the health data that exists in Finland. So all the data that is collected in, in the connection of primary care uh, in Finland. So uh, in everyday um, healthcare system, people go to doc doctors and hospitals and use uh, social services. Data is collected for, for primary purposes and all that data is then available from data for secondary use. Then we have all the national registers and also some very wide population studies uh, that you can you can get uh, through FinData. And the purpose is uh, uh, stated by the Act for Secondary Use, they are wider than just research. In addition to research and statistics, there are also purposes uh, like development and innovation teaching, knowledge-based management, and then different authorities, steering, planning, and uh, reporting duties. So th those are the purposes you can get data uh, for secondary use via FinData. Um, this picture illustrates the, the situation before April this year and and now. So before, if a researcher wanted to have uh, data from several registers, several uh, um, service providers and several uh, register, uh, national registers, uh, he or she would have to send uh, a different application to all of that, all of those uh, registers and data owners. And that was considered very time consuming. Uh, there were no uh, common standards uh, for for processes and so on. And from this April on, uh, the researcher has to send only one application to FinData, and FinData then uh, uh, collects the data from from the data controllers uh, for the client to use in our secure remote access system. Here is a slide about the, uh, the data providers. I'm not going into details, but uh, uh, big institutes and authorities in Finland, and also um, they're down with the red, uh, red uh, lines is the social and hair care systems and the electronic uh, health record system that has uh, almost 100% coverage uh, of Finnish people. All the public primary healthcare centers, public hospitals, also about 95% of the private hospitals. Uh, uh, the pharmacies, uh, since 2017, all the prescriptions ha have been in electronic form in Finland. So they are available uh, via FinData. Um, about our role, um, um, we are an independent authority located uh, at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, but making uh, decisions um, as, as independent. Uh, we grant permits uh, when the data is requested from multiple controllers always when it's requested from private healthcare units and then all the permits uh, when the data is requested from the electronic health records. After making the uh, decision, uh, giving the permit, we uh, then collect the data, link it and, and pseudonymize or anonymize it depending on, on, the, on the purpose and on the case. 
We are also uh, maintaining and uh, uh, providing an IT environment uh, for our FinData staff and for the for the data transformations between the uh, uh, data controllers and FinData. And also for our clients, we have a remote access system where, where you can then use the data you have. Um, uh, um, and, and you have an access there to the data you have the permit for. Our help desk has proven to be very popular. So we have a one-stop shop help desk in Finland uh, where you, you can ask about all the social and health data uh, in Finland. So about the, the data availability, about the data quality, about all kinds of things. Um, it, has, it has shown to be very, very necessary and very popular. And we have also anonymization services for the clients. Then some points um, I thought to do for, for this discussion and panel. Uh, uh, in case you don't know, we, we have an opt out principle in the secondary use of social and healthcare. So all the data collected in the private care can be used for secondary secondary purposes unless you don't opt out okay. and uh, you can opt out in in fin data we have um, uh, a very um i think a clear and specific um um guidance for that at our web page uh, since um until yesterday i just checked we have 177 Finnish citizens that have opted out uh, uh, from secondary use. So uh, we are a nation about 5.6 million people. So it's not um, really much. So basically we cover all the Finnish people. We don't need consent uh, for register-based register research. Um, the consent is, of course, needed for clinical uh, uh, trials and clinical research. But when you, you use registered da data, uh, you don't need any consent in Finland. Um, and then, then the last point is about price of data. We, I think we, we still are lacking the open discussion or the public discussion about this. It has started though. There on the other uh, other um, end, there are people who, who mainly researchers who think that the, all the data that is stored in the national registers and collected uh, in healthcare should be free uh, for them to use uh, free of charge. And then the in the other end, there are people who are saying that it's it's simply stupid to to give the data away to, for example, the pharmaceutical industries for uh, almost uh, no money. So FinData is an authority. So we, in, in according to Finnish uh, laws, we, we we can't have different prices for different clients. The price price is same for for all. May I ask you, so you can differentiate between a request by GAFA uh, when it, or when it comes to, to some university requests or some others? Um, the price is same for all. If, if you are doing um, an PhD, you are a student, you can, you can get the half price. But the prices are not very high. Um, so it's not... Um, not a problem. Uh, it's it can't be overcome. Many thanks. Um, um, maybe maybe uh, um, if I if I cut you, you can please continue. But do you have any negative experiences so far? It lo it, it it looks really everything spectacular to me. What you have achieved within one year, a clear objective, clear yes. message. Do you have any negative experiences? Well, we have. Um, the the act and and the legal basis uh, and all the 
connection points to other acts that are regulating the use of, of personal uh, data. They are, uh, well, how should I put it? They are not clear. Uh, the lawyers are are trying to, to figure out how to, to uh, interpret them. And then, um, well, legal issues uh, are arising all the time, but and and then then the the act uh, states some timelines for us so so we have to give the data in in certain um, uh, time for example uh, three months for the for the permission and then another three months uh, well not no no other other month for for delivering the data and we have problems uh, uh, with collecting the data from the data controllers within those time windows. But uh, part of that is is that we are, this is in, in the beginning and we are, we are like learning how to cooperate and how to, uh, how to make the processes in, in, in good fit. Um, there's a lot of things to do with our IT system. Uh, it's um, we can we can we can provide the services, but for example, the tools that our data managers and our uh, um, staff has for handling the applications are not ready yet. There is a lot of manual uh, phases that should be electronic in the future, and so 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 there are we are st still upcoming, but we we um, decided to. Uh, start the services and and be uh, agile and uh, like solve the problems as they come and de develop the processes and things as they come because um, many of of those things that we have been struggling with they they couldn't could it be uh, like um, we couldn't think of them before they 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 come up as we move forward um, the the job is very lonely uh, we are the only one stop shop in in the world i guess so there is nobody to like to copy or to ask uh, how how should we do this so um well but that's matter of of choosing the job many 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 thanks uh, thank you many thanks uh, uh, barbara listening to to joanna how what's on your mind uh, how would you comment this this uh, this beautiful loneliness well i th i think i think what joanna is doing is terrific and um, i share your <laughs> impression pencho that it's almost too good to be true so um, on the finnish uh, case um, of course, the one of the USB of especially also the Finnish healthcare system, namely to have, as Johanna also mentioned, to have almost the entire population on record. That is, of course, now also particularly dangerous because there are um, also um, attempts to to monetize that that fantastic resource. And I think initiatives such as jo Johanna's are very very important to um, steer through that uh, stormy water in, in a good way. So kudos. Thank you. Many thanks. I mean, we are having this discussion because I had an inspiration in the inception impact assessment by the European Commission, where the European Commission is asking, what can we do? Can we do a bit more? Maybe it is, is, is Europe the right place or should we push more at, at national level? And then what tools do we need? Do we need more certifications or do we need la labelings or, or whatever? Or we need maybe the, the push from, so to say, from Brussels uh, and saying you are obliged to implement in your respective countries kind of mechanism for that purpose in order to have this altruism aspect uh, in the in the society, could you comment on this, uh, Sebastian? I mean, uh, from the legal perspective, what what seems to be uh, realistic, or, or what is a more pragmatic approach at this stage? I mean, we are talking about European strategy on data, and yesterday we heard we can't achieve everything immediately, but we need really some some incremental steps. I don't think that. A legal push from Europe is a very realistic perspective. I mean, Europe has struggled for years to get to the um, General Data Protection Regulation. 
and I can't really imagine that anyone is daring uh, to 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 call that in question and and uh, and and try to change that in substantive terms. Nor does the Commission, by the way. So that seems to be a pretty fixed point. Um, uh, all the rest is in legal terms left to the member states, which have to implement it and which have certain. Uh, leeway in implementing it and as we can see with Johanna's um, presentation member states do that very differently um, uh, so the, the 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 Finnish way of dealing with uh, European data protection rules is for the time being quite different than 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 the German approach um, but very sympathetic to, <laughs> to me of course um, so I think um, we we can't leave the national legislator out of his responsibility, um, and in particular in German, because much of the difficulties which we have in, in the data protection framework, at least in, in, in health research, comes from our internal federal system and the diversity inherent in this federal system, and nobody else can help us. We have to overcome that ourselves. What is interesting on the European level, however, is, of course, any input in uh, in, on, on a soft wall, a soft law level, for example, um, defining f frameworks on how to use certain data pools, data spaces, as the Commission uh, calls it. Um, because if you create such data spaces, and one of them would be a health data space in, in, in the idea of the Commission, if you create such a pool which sh should be accessible to to anyone or any researcher or so, you must have certain rules how to use them, who should be competent to have access to it, for which purpose, under which conditions, etc., etc. Um, that is something which we try in Germany as well, but of course that would be helpful if we have a kind of European standard as a um, point of reference for such a, such a space, then I think that might help also for the national discussion to get a, a bit more liberal uh, in, in, in these things. Thank you. Uh, Dirk, you, you talk about the, posit the positive experiences so far, but for sure you're, you're missing or you have many, many hurdles uh, on, on achieving the, the objective. Uh, uh, what's on your mind when it comes to this European push? Um, when I heard that only like 177 people in Finland opted out of the 6 million that You have translated there, it into Germany. Um, I was wondering, and it kind of is in line with my experience, that there's a strong cultural variation to how we trust. And, uh, you know, the, the colleague I mentioned in Denmark, it's, it's very similar. Like the, the openness and, you know, the sort of the, the default state is trust. And that's different here. And that sort of thing has to be taken into account. And you mentioned like the federal system, you know, I, I was just thinking about, you know, trans, you know, why, why not just take this and, you know, and replicate it? Yeah, and replicate it, you know, it'd be beautiful, but it's impossible, like in this way, or it's, it's, it's an order of magnitude more difficult, I assume, because there's so many hurdles that tell you what you cannot do. And it's almost like, like with, the, with the term data donation. So I've heard and I've had like many discussions. I don't like it, but um, just saying it's not the right term is insufficient. And then we have to have another word for it. And in, the, in my experience, like with setting up the, this experiment that we did, it's talking to a lot of people that tell me what I can't do, that, you know, this can be, it can be done this way, it can be done that way, and it cannot be done this way. And there's little responsibility or incentive for people to say, uh, what's the right way of doing this? And so when I see a system like, like FinData, I see people that have implemented a system. And that's always good, and we can learn from it. Um, but, it, you know, implementing this sort of thing here just requires a lot of massive hurdles, uh, you know, little doors that say you cannot do this and you cannot do that. And, uh, you know, that's that's the situation. That's my experience. Okay. Um, we every time leave uh, the possibility for questions from the audience. Um, we have the possibility now and it's my pleasure that we have the first. Yes, um, I mean, 
I have many questions with regard uh, to the quality of these data, because I think, uh, for instance, in the case of cancer, re cancer registers, the definition and the ontology of cancer has changed a lot in the last decades. So the question is also whether in such a system like the FIN data system, there is any space for rep representatives of patients for instance, uh, or an ethics and governance council, because of course it's a state institution and people have to have a lot of trust into the trustworthiness of the state. I think in Germany, in our history, we have made um, bad, bad experiences when it comes to health data for eugenic reasons. Uh, also the questions, what's legitimate research and illegitimate research purposes needs to be clarified. The questions of re-identification of people, even though the data is anonymized, we know that if you got four or five data points, you can easily identify, re-identify the people. So in that respect, I think a lot needs to be discussed. And also the question of the quality of research outcomes. Just the idea that more data and mingling more data will provide good scientific results, I think um, it's something to be questioned. I think um, uh, really, really important remarks. Um, I believe that for sure some of those aspects are maybe regulatory uh, designed in the framework of, 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 of FIN data. Uh, Joanna, could you maybe comment on, on this question? I hope you, you could hear it. Yes. Um, um, First, I, w I would like to say that I, I totally agree with with the area, earlier comment on on um, not um, being able to copy or just transform uh, the Finnish uh, um, system to to other countries. That's that's I, I totally agree. It's uh, Fin data and uh, our secondary act is so connected with other legal. Um, uh, uh, and legal things and issues and laws in Finland uh, connected with the Finnish uh, society, with Finnish culture, and it's not just something to to be copied, uh, to be copied and and applied in another country. Um, uh, but I, I would say that the, that the, the the work has to be started on the country level. I'm not. Uh, either advising uh, um, of creating a big data pools where uh, very sensitive health data from uh, citizens from many countries are, are collected, but but to keeping the data in separate points and then, then uh, uh, making sure that it be collected for... So, so we always give the data for the certain purpose, for certain study, for a certain time, for certain people that we have the names of, so it's not it's it's very specific and it has to be there has to be good reasons for for giving it. So we are not giving the data away uh, just to lie in a pool. It's not um, it's not what we do. Um, um, sorry, and uh, what was the other other question about the anonymization? Uh, I think we are following the the um, uh, discussion about anonymize, anonymizing methods. Uh, we have some, some very good uh, uh, staff members uh, in that. We also have a national board giving us uh, guidelines about anonymization uh, methods. Um, but uh, as we all know, uh, in, in the modern world, there is no such thing as an anonymized data. But um, well, we have an act that uh, has has um, as a starting point that that uh, data should be anonymized. So we are doing it so uh, good as we can. But there is al always the the risk that remains. But we just have to cope with that. Um, we are never giving out direct identifiers such as name or social security numbers, and if we give out data on the individual level, it would be it would be put in our remote access system. So that's a huge rise in in this in the data security compared to the to the um, uh, system um, that 
that was before and is partially still ongoing that people are uh, having uh, sensitive data on their laptops and memory sticks and wherever. So um, having that all that the, the use centralized in, in our remote access system, it, it um, improves the data security a lot. Many thanks. Uh, having in mind uh, that uh, we, are, we, are pro we are approaching the end, unfortunately, uh, of, the, of, the, of the discussion, but still I would, I would like to, to hear your reflections on, uh, at the end and, and maybe your, your recommendations to the European Commission in, in this respect. I believe you, you all support the idea that the European Commission is asking uh, what to do and how to, to approach this issue. So it would be good maybe in, in just in, uh, in, in one minute if we could close this session with some, some main key takeaways and start with with uh, Barbara, uh, Sebastian and Edien Dirk. Yeah, so thank you, Pencho. Um, so trust is key. And um, I think we all agree that one size fits not doesn't fit all. One model doesn't fit all. For example, especially with the German data, we also found that people in Germany are even less willing to share, but not because they hoard or anything, but because um, the, the, the right of, of informational self-determination is seen as a positive citizen duty. Um, so things are very nuanced, they are very complex. One thing we need to do is we need to make sure that data can be used, especially for public benefit, that where they are not used for public benefit, there is some benefit sharing with the public and I totally agree that, this, that just saying data donation is not a good concept is not enough. Um, we should think of ways to ensure that we can use um, what Barbara Koenig used, uh, called the consent to be governed. So we can also delegate our um, right to self-determination to bodies who we trust. They need to include patient representatives, they need to include citizen representatives, they need to have good governance models so that we have a distributed, um, nested way of um, controlling data that combines individual and collective control and always um, civil, science, uh, civil society oversight. And there are models out there, um, broad consent is something that we need to think about more um, in the medical field and beyond. And um, I could go on, but I stop here. Many thanks to you, Barbara. Sebastian, what's on your mind? Perhaps very, very, very shortly. I think in Germany we have a very much a risk, a risk based perspective on all debates of this kind. And we tend to neglect uh, the chances. Now we know from uh, from economic law, we always have to keep in mind both, of course, uh, but I think um, uh, we focus too much on the risks as a starting point. And from there we come that, that we are always saying, no, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, instead of trying to constructively think from the end, which might be, might be useful. And the second remark perhaps is um, that the risks which we discuss um, should focus more on, on the, the, the technical solutions, like working with remote access areas, for example, which I find very, a very intriguing idea as far as it is technically feasible, um, and uh, less on the concept that we have a sharp distinction between treatment and research, and treatment is good and research is bad. That is not the case. And, and switch data from treatment to research is as such not a bad thing. So as long as we can deal with the technical side, I think we should uh, try to deal with that in a very constructive manner. Many, many thanks. And Dirk, finally. Yeah, I, um, my final comments are that we should stress uh, the social aspect of this. And uh, when we talk about public data, or when I think about myself as uh, as a scientist who works for a you know a public institution, which, that means that the taxpayer pays my salary, exactly. and that is anything I do is in the service to the public essentially. And when we donate data, I think when we construct something, we should we should be more explicit about the fact that it is a social act. You know, because it is helping. It is helping others. It is helping insights, etc. So whenever we do this, and I can see this in the feedback I get from the donors that give us our data, they are very well aware of what they're doing is good for the public, 
and they also see it in our activities. And, um, and so I think that's an important aspect of this. It's not only a data point and someone uses it and then it's gone, but like, you know, making sure there's communication, information flow uh, in both directions is important and, you know, conveying that it's a social act. With this uh, beautiful remark at the end, the social aspect, we are closing this session. It was really a pleasure to find out more about thin data, about the general notion, about the legal hurdles, and what we have achieved in Germany so far with the uh, Corona Donation app, and where we could go further. We truly support the initiative of the European Commission, and we are really looking forward to what will happen in the legislative process in the, in the coming months. I think we have prolonged the time, but it was worth. Many, many thanks for your passion. Many thanks for, to the techniques that, that it worked at the end. Uh, we make just small break and we continue really to the issue with the issue of trust and with, with the keynote of uh, Anouk.